think like a minute. Hey everybody, this is Scott with Pray 5. Um, this is going to be, uh, again, part. this is going to be part four of prophecies on the rapture, tribulation, and the second coming. All three are separate events. Two of them are linked together, obviously, the during the tribulation and the second coming. The rapture, <clears throat> and we've been going over, if you're new to this, uh, what, we're, what we're doing is we're uh, showing biblically a pre-trib rapture. Uh, I'm getting ready to say, talk about some of the comments and answer them right now because some of you are thinking of this, so therefore I should answer them. Uh, we're getting started quickly because I want to be respectful of your time. There's a lot of information. We can see, see how much we can get going, okay? So let's go ahead and pray, shall we? Father, thank you for this time together, your blessings, your mercy, your grace. We ask that you would give us the wisdom and the words to say through your Holy Spirit. We ask for your truth. We ask for the blessings and protection of Israel and that your gospel and would go throughout these people that are in these disasters and that you would help them and provide for them and also the gospel most of all. And we ask that for the healing of our nation <clears throat> and we ask for a, a revival to sweep this nation starting in our churches. And it's in the name of our Messiah, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Last week, okay, we're getting a lot more views than I was, was expecting, obviously. Um, and thank you. I, all of you, all the comments are not satis are not uh, complimentary. I'll just put it that way. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, I disagree with uh, some of the. You know, I see the difference between a comment just thrown out there and they didn't you didn't do any research uh, on just throw a comment out there randomly with no no backing up of scripture or anything. I'm not talking about that one. You see that on there. I left it on there on purpose just for that reason. But there's also other comments where somebody goes through and types out why they believe a certain way. That I can respect. Okay, I know you're and the, the the man watching. You know, respect your. You know, we respectfully disagree. We agree on some of the stuff, but some of the stuff we don't. And I'm going to get into that. Uh, and it was enough on the comments that I needed to address these. Um, as you can tell, <laughs> I use old school. The I also use them on my computer, but. If, you, in the, if you're wanting to get more information after this video, uh, you can go to pray5.org. That's pray, P R A Y, the number 5.org. And you can go in, is the rapture biblical? You can type in, tribula you know, type in tribulation uh, as far as also is Christ God. Therefore, and what about the, the, the Trinity? Stuff like that. Okay, you can even type in, if you're interested in the occult. Uh, are it, it Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, where they believe, stuff like that. Okay, there's a lot of videos, a lot of information. Okay, what I wanted to go ahead and address, also, there's some videos out there, of some pastors that are doing a real good job, and I'm not going to uh, just pass it by without giving them uh, the uh, the recognition of who what they wrote. Uh, first one is, Why There Must Be a Pre-Trib Rapture by Jack Hibbs. Real Life Ministries is what it is, real, like R-E-A-L, Life Ministries. And you can go to YouTube and type in uh, why, there, why There Must Be a Pre-Tribulation Rapture by Jack Hibbs. Um, he does a real good job of it. Um, and there's also other information on here. And I'll give inf the information on who, where I springboarded off of as, as it comes up, okay? If you see anything on the site that, besides what I'm teaching now, which is my own material, if you, if you go to the site and it says, uh, you see me either teaching, which obviously that's me, but if you see any documents or whatever, that's you can tell it's been handwritten and it says, just a thought, or J-A-T, that's me. That's my original stuff, that's how I mark it. Uh, so therefore, but if it's not, it'll have the person's, uh, the writer, whether it be R.C. Sproul or, or Jack Hibbs or whomever, okay? so. I'm going to address all the, uh, quite a bit of questions, quite a bit of material in the questions. I can't answer them. I'll answer them all at the same time instead of going to each individual, okay? So if this is your question that you asked, let me go ahead, or, or that you disagreed or comment, here we go. Okay, first of all, the, the, the word rapture is in all the languages. It's, it's called to be caught up forcibly 
uh, or violently. Um, and the, the thing is, it's called caught up. And you can type in caught up in the Bible on Google, and it'll bring up all the places where it says caught up. And you can look up, it's called harpazo in the Greek, and uh, rapturo in the Latin, and heck, even in the Russian, it says rapture. Okay, so that's, it's all, it means the same thing. Okay, it's a, it's a biblical doctrine, which it's not, there's, I get so people telling me, hey, this came out in 1830-something when a, a little girl had a, a vision, and then these guys ran with it, and it, it wouldn't hurt of until, until then. That's completely untrue, and we're, that's why we're going over this series. And I'm going to explain why we're doing this series the way that I'm doing it, is to show proof in Scripture about a pre-trib rapture. And if you're saying, well, I disagree with it, well, hang around and just listen to and, and do the research yourself. And if you have a predisposed disposition on it and you, you don't want to care to, to, to listen to it, I'm, well, I can't do anything about that. Okay? But this is, like I say, it's a biblical doctrine and it's a foundational statement. Okay, the rapture is a church event and not an Israel, Israel event. What I mean by that is during the tribulation is where the time is turned, God turns his attention to Israel. Okay, <clears throat> right now it's the church age. We, the bride of Christ, are, the bride of Christ is here now. We're the, this is the church age or the age of the Gentile. It will switch at the rapture to where the attention goes to Israel and to the Jewish people. Okay. God will turn his attention there. Okay, so will the Antichrist and his his uh, followers trying to kill them all. Okay, and I'll go over that also where that says in the, in the Bible how many will be killed. Um, we look forward to our blessed hope, which is Titus 2.13. Uh, the blessed hope is the hope of being taken out away from what's going to happen. And the blessed hope can't be, oh, we're going to, our blessed hope and expectation can't be Okay, we're going to go in the tribulation and be killed, beheaded, beaten, uh, starved, uh, and, and, and persecuted and hunted for seven years. That's a blessed hope. That, has, that context doesn't, doesn't agree with that. Okay, And Christ says our, our blessed hope. Plus also one of the things, is I'm going to jump ahead on one of my comments here, is that the ark, and it was mentioned specifically, the ark was... You know, God didn't take Noah and his family out of the world. He provided for them in the ark, and that's a foreshadowing of what the rapture is. Also, the Hebrews getting out of Egypt, or if you're looking at your Hebrew Bible, it's mysterium. Mysterium is to be pulled out. It said the plagues would affect the, the Egyptians, but wouldn't, it, but wouldn't affect the, the Hebrews. Yes, that's true. But the difference is in the tribulation, Satan, according to Scripture, is turned loose to, to cause war upon the saints, to persecute and to kill them. And God says, I'll, turn, I'll allow that to happen. He, they will, he will be allowed to attack and to kill the church, the saints. Specifically, it says saints. Why is that important? Because a saint is, as we know, the symbol or is the... When, when God says saint or priest and saints in the church age, that is a born-again believer. A saint isn't something that, the, that a Catholic church says, oh, this person's a saint. How do we know that? Because very clearly when he says, that, like for instance, the biggest thing is there's only like 400 some odd saints that have been put together by the Catholic church. When it talks about how the saints will come with Christ, it says 10,000 times 10,000 saints, okay? That's more than, I mean, that's us. And explains that we, as a believer, are called saints and priests in the Word of God. Whether you act like it or not, it's up to you. But so he will create war on these saints during the tribulation. He will attack them and will will kill most of them. So that can't the, the context isn't anywhere near the same as the ark and when they were leaving out of Egypt because Satan. God protected them, sure, while they were at it. He protected them in the ark as in being raised above the death, taken away from the death and the destruction. Also, the number one thing that I was coming across in the, in the uh, comments 
was, well, you know, we're going to have to go, the, the church, the bride is going to have to go through the tribulation and be beat up and persecuted and it's going to be strengthening and purifying. Nowhere in scripture does it say that. There, there are no verses saying it's going to be used to purify the church. The church age, the bride of Christ is taken out. Those are tribulation saints. And the thing is, it's called the day of wrath. Okay, that was brought up in a comment. Now, the day of wrath, never, never, Old Testament, New Testament, never, never says, does it ever refer to hell. So when Christ says, I will spare you from the, the day of wrath or from the, the wrath to come, that's not referring to hell or the lake of fire. It, the context, it, it's, you know, that's not the word. Orge, orge is in the Greek, and that's not hell. It's not, it's, it's not Sheol in the Hebrew or tar, uh, Tartus, uh, Tartarus in the, in the Greek. No. Wrath, when he says, I will spare you from the day of wrath or from the day of wrath or the wrath that's to come, which we're going to read the, the actual verse here, it never refer, wrath, the term wrath never refers to hell or the lake of fire, ever. It's the wrath of God upon this earth. When I say earth, I don't mean, you know, sure, like what we're going through right now, where our world is being destroyed or being torn up, which are the birth pains, and it could happen, for, this could go on for years. It could go on for weeks or years. So don't get too uh, caught up on that right now, okay? Don't get your actual wrapped around that. Uh, but, the, but the wrath is God pouring out his wrath upon an unbelieving world. It never says that he pours his wrath out on a believer, on a believing nation. He blesses them. Okay? Now, the thing is, um, judgment is poured out upon the, uh, you know, upon, upon the unbelieving earth. Okay? So, the, um, well, I was sitting there thinking about, sorry, my brain, I've got two different subjects in my, two different sentences in my head. Um, let me go ahead and start here so I can quit chasing these rabbits, if I will. There's too much going on. i got to get back to my schedule. It says, we look forward to our blessed hope, which is Titus 2.13. That's what I was telling you about. Um, and again, the wrath never refers to hell or the lake of fire. It's the judgment upon the earth, not the believer. So if we go into the rapture or into the tribulation, we'll be slaughtered. Uh, we're not saved. Why would God pour out his... 21 different disciplines and wrath upon a believer who going into there to discipline them or to for them to be they said well it's to be purified and sanctified that is not in scripture there that doesn't exist okay uh but it is now for the ones who become believers after the rapture and during the tribulation that's different they will the god's wrath won't be poured upon them the attack of the enemy will be and he will be stopped. Satan will actually be kicked out of heaven and confined to the earth where the war against the saints will, will be to subdue and to kill them, to kill the saints from Satan. Satan right now is not in hell. He's not, he's not in the lake of fire. There's no one in the lake of fire right now. But he's not in hell. The only ones that are in hell right now that are being held are the demons that had sex with, with women and created the Nephilim. God put them in everlasting chains until the, until the day of judgment. Those are the only ones. Satan is allowed to go back and forth to the throne room to, to, to uh, say that we as believers are sinning against God he, he, to, con, to uh, bring a charge against us. Okay? That stops. It says that Michael and his, and his angels fought against the, against the devil and his angels, and they were defeated and thrown to the earth. And when they were thrown to the earth, he knew his time was short, and he took out his anger on the entire earth, searching for us, for those, that, when I say us, I mean the believing population. And he kills as many as he can. Okay? He wars against the saints to subdue and to kill them. This is not a, this, again, this is not a case of, uh, like I was explaining with Noah and the Egyptians, or the Hebrews. Um, First Thessalonians chapter 4, if you remember, it, says, you know, it talks about where we'll be, we'll be caught up. This is where the rapture is talked about, where Paul is the one who talked about the rapture. And I'm going to talk about uh, Jesus here in a second, Yeshua, on how he was talking about it also. But Paul and John both, and even Jude, Jesus' half-brother, they spoke about this. And they're not the only ones. There's more to it. 
but it says that in First Thessalonians, it says, you know, the term will be caught up, a rapturo, harpazo. It talks about uh, the event because, you know, people are talking about the post, me, me, I'm sorry. We've got pre-trib rapture, we've got pre-trib rapture, mid-trib rapture is a belief, and then post-trib, okay? The reason we don't have a mid-trib, like I said last week, was because there's a seven year time frame, right? Two, three and a half year periods, which we're gonna talk about again tonight also. Also a post-trib is saying is that the rapture is gonna happen at the end of the tribulation. Well, there's a problem. If you remember in, uh, it's gonna be in John chapter 14, uh, the first part of the chapter. John chapter 14, where Christ says, I go to prepare a place for you and my, um, there, for their many mansions in my father's house it could be many rooms is is a better translation because the father's house is one humongous house with many rooms and he said i go prepare a place for you and when i i go and then i will come back when i will come back and get you and bring you to where i am at which is at the father's house which is in heaven if we have a post rapture that would mean christ who is on the mount of olives physically on the Mount of Olives and then comes down for a thousand years and takes over the throne of David in Jerusalem. That means that we'd be raptured up and make a U-turn and come right back and never go to the, to the uh, it would violate <coughs> John chapter 14. We wouldn't go to the, to the mansions and the rooms that God or that Christ provided and made for us ready. Because it says, I will bring you to where I'm at. If he's on the earth, that means we do a U-turn and come right back to where we were and we don't get that would be a false statement. And we know God can't lie. So when he says, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go, I will come back and, and, and receive you to bring you, get you, and then bring you back to where I'm at is in heaven. Can't be a post trip because then it, it cuts that part of scripture out. You'd have to pull that part of scripture out because it doesn't fit. Okay? So, um, and then that's when you're saying in first uh first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13 through 18 is where it talks about the rapture about where we're caught up and we'll be with him and also a retelling of it is second thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1 through 12 where paul says that the the rat you'll have a falling away first then you'll have that the holy spirit the restrainer will be removed and then the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but not until the, God, the Holy Spirit is removed. The Holy Spirit is omniscient or omnipresent. He is everywhere. His presence in us is taken out. He's still here because he's God. Okay, but, it, but the context is, is that he is removed out of, he, his presence in us is gone. So if you're at the beginning of the first of the seven year tribulation, then that would make sense, and here's why. And I'm going to explain it here again. I'm going to make this one a repetitive statement. Matthew, Mark, and Luke says, no one knows the hour of the day of the coming of the Son of Man, not even Jesus Christ himself when he was in human form. Okay, so if you're in the tribulation, that's when you see the signing of the peace agreement with our world leader, with Israel, and the many for, one, for seven years, you're going to know the hour, the day, the location, and the season of the coming, second coming of the Son of Man. You say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. And I've said this. This is my fourth video, and I say this each time because I have a lot of new people coming in each time, so please bear with me. No one knows the hour or the day of the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. But according to Daniel and Zechariah, Messiah will show up on the Mount of Olives, and even John the Re Revelator in Revelation will show up on the Mount of Olives seven years after the signing of that peace agreement. So everybody will know. So if you see him sign the peace agreement, you're going to know exactly where he's going to show up and when, where, and how. So those two are, are two different events. They can't say, well, we're in the tribulation, and we don't, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke says you're not going to know the, when he's going to return, but... But yet the other part of the Bible says, yeah, you are going to know on the second coming, not the rapture. Okay? So that would that would, doesn't make sense. Okay? 
Um, that'd be Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 on that specific one. And then Zechariah chapter 14. You can go 1 through 6 on that. Uh, Revelation 3.10, and then we'll finish on this comment on this one. Uh, it says that, he, that Christ will keep, Revelation 3.10, you know, it says Christ says that he will keep us from the hour of trial that comes upon the whole earth. In other words, this is a worldwide event to test those who dwell upon it. It says he will keep us from the hour of trial. His words, this is the words of our Messiah. He says, I'm not going to have you go through the wrath. I'm, and your blessed hope is, is that, you will, that, that you will skip this. If we're going to go, why would we be looking forward to going through the, through the tribulation? That's to, that is not scriptural. He says, I will spare you from the day of wrath. His words. Okay, now uh, let's go ahead and go into, finally, this is week four. So what we're going to do is let's go into 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Um, see, I've got everything. I wanted to... Okay, this is on... A, I'm sorry. This is the second part of some of the questions. I'll just read them real quickly. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. This is to wait for his son from heaven, who he raised from the dead, even, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And the wrath is not hell or, or the lake of fire. Obviously, I already said that. Because if we go in the tribulation, then we're in the middle of it. And God's, that means God will pour out his wrath on us as well. So that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Also, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but, it, but to obtain salvation through our, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we, be, we, whether we wake or sleep, alive or dead, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you always have doing. And again, like I told you before, there's no comfort in thinking that we're going to have to go through hell on earth during the tribulation. That's not a blessed hope. That's completely contrary to what Scripture says. This next one is, please forgive me, this is, uh, I was kind of hesitant on putting this in here. Uh, one of the comments, this was rather unflattering. I'm sorry if you meant, it, if you meant this differently, please let me know. This is, I'm not, I'm not sure if this one was a serious comment. So if it is, I needed to address it. Called the, doc, the, the doctrine of the, uh, of the rapture a false doctrine. And the rapture in the Bible, you know, like I say, John 14 talks about it, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians talks about it, and Revelation talks about it, and Jude talks about it. Okay. So therefore, as far as it being said, yeah, it's, it's, it's a doctrinal statement. If that's not what you meant, if you were just being facetious, please let me know. I don't, I don't, want, to miss, I don't want to miss misquote you. <clears throat> it says, when Christ appears, this is the second time he appears, to those who pierced him. Now, this was one that I, I, that I was looking at because I got a lot of comments. To those who pierced him, he said, they will look upon the one whom they pierced. Pierced, in other words, the ones who they stuck. This is going to be in Hebrews chapter 9, 28. And also John 19, 37, Zechariah 12, 10. It says, this will be, this time when it says they will look upon him and everybody will see him. This is when, at the end of the tribulation, not before, but at the end, not at the rapture. This is the, at the end of the tribulation because it says all the earth will see him and they will mourn for that one that they pierced, and they will see him. And this is also the ones who haven't taken the mark of the beast, the Jewish people who haven't taken the mark of the beast, and the, the Gentiles, obviously, who haven't taken the mark, especially the, specifically the Jewish people, says they will look at him who they pierced, and it says all of Israel will be saved. That's in Romans chapter 11, verse 26. It says all of Israel will be saved. Well, Two out of three will be dead. Two-thirds of the Jewish people will be dead. Zechariah chapter 13. It says that, the, that he will kill two-thirds of the Jewish population. So one-third says, well, so therefore, yeah, all of Israel will be saved because they will, all, they will bow because they'll be able to see him when he comes back on the Mount of Olives. This is at the end of the tribulation. <clears throat> and this is not referring to the bride of Christ. This is referring to the tribulation saints, the ones who get, who get saved during that seven-year hell on earth. 
Also, you want to go into yeah, Romans 11, chapter 25 and 26 on that. Uh, one third is killed is verse uh, Zechariah 13 8. 13 8. I know I'm getting a lot of information out there, but I know that y'all go back and redo this so you can write it down. Uh, there's just so much information. I'm trying to cut it down, so please forgive me on that. Um, already said that. Already said that. Okay. Let's go ahead and go into Revelation chapter 12. Any bets? Y'all laugh at me each week. Starting, starting to get a complex here. Revelation chapter 12. We're going to try to get through this. And this one is going to be on the woman, the child, the dragon. Uh, and as far as uh, what, the, what, what these mean, let's go ahead and read it. And I'll go back and, and, and we'll explain this. This is on Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 through 6. Let's start off there. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with sun and with the moon under her feet, and her head a garland of 12 stars. That's going to be the 12 tribes of Israel. This woman is, you have a dual meaning here. The first time it was was, was when the, the, the virgin conceived and it was, it was Christ. This is talking about Israel. This is not a physical woman. This is the land of Israel. And that we're getting ready to find out that Satan's waiting on her to be birthed, Israel to come together so he can kill it. Okay, because if he kills Israel, all the Muslims that are trying to attack Israel are under the command of one individual to kill Israel. Because if he can get throw them off into the ocean, prophecy can't be fulfilled and he wins. But we already know how this ends because he's already at the end of time waiting on us. So that's what we're looking at here, okay? He's, ex he's explaining this. Um, now, in the woman, there's three, different, there's three different types of women in, the, in, in Revelation. You have the 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 woman. Uh, I'll just read it here. Let me see. It's in here. So, yeah. You have first of all, you have the symbolic woman that appears in Revelation. First is Jezebel, who represents paganism. That's what we have. You know, it's going on right now, but it's going to get really bad during the tribulation. Uh, the Scarlet Woman. If you remember the Scarlet Woman riding the beast, remember that the whore. That's a word. I'm not. I'm not cussing. That's what it says in the Bible: a, a, a harlot or a, a, a prostitute. It says the scarlet woman symbolizing the apostate church. That would be one of the main churches that's going to be surrounded by several mountains. I think it's 12 mountains. That's a world power. That's its own city, its own nation. They have a, a lot, a lot of influence, a lot of power, a lot of money. Okay. And it includes also the, the uh, other churches that are, that are following right in line with them. And then you have the wife of the lamb, which is a symbolization of the true church. The true church is the ones who are before the tribulation, before the rapture, that are that are following him now, and the ones during the tribulation, which will be be uh, uh, come out in persecution, who will die for their die for the for the savior, other than to deny him. They'll be stronger than ever. Okay. This is a verse two. That's right. Verse two. Then being with child, she carried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon. Obviously, the red dragon is the symbol of Satan. Uh, you have the beast and then the false prophet. So that's the unholy trinity. Satan, the, be uh, the uh, antichrist who is the son of Satan, is, and then the false prophet. A fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Okay, what does that mean? If you remember correctly, um, Satan, there's been several, uh, seven different uh, uh, countries that have come through history, like Babylon, Syria, the Romans, Egyptians, Greece, that came through that, he, that those regions are still here. There, those, those locations are still here. He is in control of them. Okay. Out of those group, out of that group, and I'm going to read, read about that, is when we get into 13, about the revived Roman edition. I talked about that last week. Well, I'm going to read about it here in just a second. He's going to have 10. There's going to be, there's going to be 10 horns. Of these seven horns, there's going to be 10, and they're going to have a little horn on the top of one of them. That little horn means... You got ten 
You can have 10 nations, 10 districts, or whatever. They're going to split the, the world up to where he, can, where he can be in control of it. Well, what's going to happen is he'll be in charge of those 10. He'll kill three of them that will, that will rebel against him. Okay? Leaving seven. Out of one of those seven, he's going to come out of, it says the little horn is going to come out. They say, well, speak blasphemies against God in the heavens. That's the Antichrist, the one who has the authority, the one who has the power and takes over and becomes the one world government, the one world leader. Okay, That's the one who's going to sign the contract with Israel for the, to start the seven-year tribulation. Okay, it says, And his tail, that's Satan's tail, drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them onto the earth. He took a third of the angels. He convinced a third of the angels to disobey God, who they also knew as the creator. Okay. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth and to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child. This is Israel, okay? The, we're, we're talking about before, obviously, he was there waiting to kill Jesus. That's when uh, you know Herod tried to kill all the, the children two years and under, not infants, two years and under. So when, when the wise men came to visit uh, Jesus, he was a toddler, Came, they said they got came to his father's house, not not Bethlehem, to see the child, not the babe. And Herod was going to kill all the kids in that area, two male children, two and under. If he'd just been born, it would have been all the infants that had just been born. Okay, so he's talking about that also. He was waiting for him. Well, now he's waiting for Israel. That's why Israel is surrounded by her enemies. That's why God says, "You're not going to take her." supernaturally is protecting Israel from the nations that are around her right now that want to absorb her and throw that kill every last Jew in there because that way they can take it over and then prophecy will not be fulfilled. Think about it. God said that he is going to put at the very end, the last thing he's going to do after building new heavens and new earth is he's going to bring down the, city, the holy city of Jerusalem in Israel. And it's going to have the 12 tribes of Israel on the gates, the 12 apostles on the foundations. All, all but two of them are Jewish. So when you have people say, oh, all these evil Jews, yeah, there's, people, there's evil Jews just like there's evil Gentiles. And the thing is, but the Satan knows if he can get Israel off the map, if he can just get a nuclear bomb and destroy that place, he wins. And God says it's not going to happen. So the people that hate the Jewish people, are actually hating God, even though they may not be believers. Not Very few of them are, believe, are actually saved believers right now. But he's saying, if you hate them, you hate me. Keep that in mind. When you, when next time you're making fun of, of that nation or you want them to say, no, to heck with them, let's just get them off the map. It's completely against Scripture. That means you're, it's actually against the Creator. Okay. Welcome to church. And he was there to devour the child as soon as it was, as it was born. And she bore a male child who was to rule the nation, all nations with a rod of iron. That's Christ at the end of the tribulation and when he comes in and takes over on the seat of David, on the throne of David. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Remember how we say he ascended? Okay, so we, you're having more than one meaning here. Hopefully you're picking, on, picking up on this. And it says... Verse 6, it says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she was has a place by, uh, prepared by God that they should feed her feed her there for 1,260 days. 42 months. Ladies and gentlemen, church, this is where they go to Edom, Moab, and Ammon. And that is going to be in Daniel uh, 1141. Daniel 1141. Bless you. And the thing is, Petra... <clears throat> Excuse me. Petra is in Jordan. God says, I'm prepared. When, when you, the one third of the people who get there, the one third of the Jewish people who make it, he says, I will supernaturally protect them and provide for them. So when they take off running with all, with all, with all just the shirt on their back, literally, he says, I'll provide for you food, water, whatever you need. And he'll also, if you'll notice, you never ever after this see where the, the it shows that this, the dragon 
is spewing waters out, trying to drown her and opening up and trying to do whatever he can to kill Israel. It says God opens up the earth and swallows the water and gets it. In other words, he stops it. All these 150,000 missiles that are pointed at Israel right now by the, by the enemy of God, didn't matter if there's a million of them getting ready to take off. It's not going to kill them. Now, there will be a lot of war in the middle of Israel, but it will not eliminate the nation or all the people. It will kill off two-thirds during the tribulation. So, because God says, I'm not going to allow it to happen. But it never says that, he, that the, the serpent or the dragon or the beast or the false prophet ever go to Edom, Moab, and Ammon to attack them. It's never talked about again. They're supernaturally protected and they stay away from it. Let me see. Yeah, seven, it's going through uh, verse 7. Satan is thrown out of heaven. And it says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, Satan, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Because right now they're allowed to go back and forth to accuse, the, accuse us of sin. Verse 9, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan. Satan means deceiver, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now I'm going to go to verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. He said rejoice. In other words, we know, we're, they know they're winning. But, but, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to having great wrath because he knows his time is short. Wrath can't mean hell. The devil can't put you in hell. Great wrath is just that, anger, attacking, violence against somebody, his wrath, his anger against the, the, the believing population. Um... Actually, we're going to make it into Revelation 13. I huh. know. Oh, don't don't fall over. I don't want you. I don't want to have to get a, get the AED over there off the wall. Verse 13. <clears throat> Let me see where I'm going to go on this one. Uh, real quickly on the Revived Roman Edition, I had to write it down because uh, this is a is a is a copy. This one should be 100 percent that I, I copied off of or main. Yeah, it is off of gotquestions.com gotquestions.com is a real good site <clears throat> I was going over my studies and not every, I mean this is something that I agree with and so they had made it sound all nice and pretty so I didn't have to reinvent the wheel so that's gotquestions.com the revived Roman Empire in Daniel chapter 2 which is 2 chapter 2 verse 41 through 43 this passage concerns Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the of an image of various metals. Remember he had the statue, the head was gold, which was him. Then it went from him to the Medo-Persians. Then it went to uh, Greece. Then it went to the Romans. Then it went to, down to the feet. Remember how the, 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 the legs were made of iron. Remember? Okay. So the legs were made of iron, which was the Roman Empire. And there was two legs. You think, well, what difference does that make? If you remember, during... At, towards the end of Rome, when they were so big and so massive, they had to split the nation, the Roman Empire, into two pieces because it was just too much for one, one uh, ruler. They had two rulers. Well, what happens when you split up something? You give two rulers. They both want to take over. So they were separated, but there was two. started off as one and then went down the legs and came to the feet. <clears throat> the feet are made of iron and clay. Iron and clay. The iron represents Rome. The clay represents everybody else around them. And they just have a, a, a fragile piece. How many toes? Ten. Ten toes. Talks about how, we just talked about how Satan or the Antichrist is going to have ten different nations. Just talked about the, the horns, <clears throat> the seven di di diadems and the ten horns. Ten toes. And it's a ten, you're gonna have, he's going to have ten Ten districts, or whatever they're going to call it, they're going to call it something. So, therefore, the ten toes are going to represent during that time the ten different areas of the world. But it's put together with clay and iron. Let's read about it. 
It says, Nebuchadnezzar's dream made, had an image of various metals. The iron legs represented the Roman Empire and the feet partially of iron and partially of baked clay. That's Daniel 2.33, which represent the final empire. <clears throat> there was, it goes through uh, to three different empires. The last empire, the fourth last, the fourth empire is going to be him, or the seventh empire. It depends on which section you're reading in Daniel, but the last one is talking about the, the dispensation or the, the, the empire of the Antichrist. It's going to be greater than all of them combined. So Daniel 2.23 re represents the final world empire. The fact that it shares the element of iron with the fourth kingdom. Again, this is going to be the, the fourth kingdom is going to be the Antichrist's kingdom. You need to read the book of Daniel along with Revelation at the same time. They're bookends. The fourth kingdom suggests a connection to Rome, and the ten toes could imply a ten-nation confederacy matching the ten horns in Daniel chapter 7, verse 20, led collectively, collectively by a single powerful ruler. That's the Antichrist. Okay. <clears throat> so, if you remember what happens at the end of Revelation, where it says then there will be a... An, in Daniel says there will be a, in Daniel chapter two there will be an unhewn stone drawn from a mountain from the holy mountain which is God's mountain in Israel, and he said it will be cast at the feet of that statue. It's a symbolization of all the nations, all the seven, those seven nations that existed prior. That he will smash them, and it'll, it'll turn into dust and disappear, and then he will rule, and that stone will become. And a mountain will grow up and will consume the earth. That mountain is, is Christ. His authority will take over the entire earth forever after that. And all the other nations will fall to the, to the side after he does that. He'll crush them. That's at the end of the tribulation when he sets foot on the Mount of Olives. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 13, uh, 1 through 5. This is the beast from the sea. Now, sea represents not water. It represents the population of the earth. It's a term, it's a context used. When you say C, it's referring to the population of the earth. Okay? It says, Then I saw, then I stood on the sand of the sea. Remember, this is John the Revelator. And I saw a great beast rising up from the sea. In other words, coming out of the population of the earth, having seven heads and ten horns. There we go again. And on his horns, ten crowns. In other words, he makes, he's given authority to ten different nations or ten different districts, however they split it up, and ten, and ten crowns, and on his, on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear. Think about this. This is different animals of different countries. The bear is what? Russia. Uh, the leopard, the eagle, which eagle was, was uh, Rome, and also the eagle was the United States, but we don't see the United States in, in Scripture. People say, oh, oh, no, oh, no. No, it's not in Scripture. It does not. You can twist it, but it doesn't say the king of the West. Okay, we're not in there. Why aren't we in there? We're either absorbed or we don't know. <clears throat> so if you see the eagle, that's going to be the, that's going to be Rome. And the feet of a bear and the mouth of, of a lion. And the dragon gave him, gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. In other words, the beast is going to be a ruler over all these countries, and he's got his authority and his strength and his power is going to come from Satan himself. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. This is a fake killing, as if it was mortally wounded. It did say with a mortal wound, as if he's going to be shot in the eye. Because we see in the Old Testament, um, try, I can't remember. <coughs> if you're on, um, on YouTube, maybe I'll remember to put the passage up there. But he'll be shot. He'll be shot in the in the eye. One of the, I think it's his. Uh, I want to say it's his right or his left eye. I can't remember which one. Well, anyway, he gets shot in one of the eyes, and he he uh, is. And I think it's his right eye and causes his right hand to go to have problems. I'll, I'll find it. Uh, anyway, the thing is, is everybody's gonna say, "Oh, he's dead. He's dead." And they're going to mourn for him, and the world is just going to go crazy over this. And oh man, we just lost our Messiah. He's going to come as a Messiah. They're, th they're going to start getting, building up to that. Well, what happens is then he's entered by Satan. That body's entered by Satan. Miraculously resurrects as it's a false resurrection like Christ, the true resurrection. This one will be a false resurrection from the unholy trinity. 
Okay. <clears throat> it says, and I saw one of his head, it says, one of his head, heads as if he'd been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed and all the world mar marveled and, fall and followed the beast so that they worshiped the dragon. The dragon is Satan. So they worshiped the dragon, Satan, who gave authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast. They worshiped Satan and the Antichrist. They're worshiping the devil and the Antichrist. This is paganism. And, they, and they've already been convinced that this is the Messiah. So you have my Jewish friends who are looking for the, the first coming of the Messiah will fall for that for three and a half years. The first three and a half, not the second three and a half. <clears throat> People who are left on earth who think they're Christian, who may or may say, we don't know who this is, who don't know their Bible, will follow him. And the Muslims who are looking for their 12th Iman or looking for their for their Messiah, he'll fill up all he'll 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 pretend to be all three of those. And they'll say they'll worship the beast, saying, Who is like this beast? Who is able to make war with him? Notice he's strength. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. That's 1260 days in the Jewish calendar. That's the second three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth and, and blasphemed against God and to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. In other words, he's, he's cussing them out and calling them blasphemy. He's very, very arrogant. And it was granted unto him to make war with the saints. Remember, what we talked about that. The saints are the believers that are during that tribulation time, the tribulation saints. To make war with the saints and to overcome them, to kill them or imprison them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell upon the earth will worship him. It means 100%? No, it's talking about in general. In other words, the earth will say this is the Messiah. Just like now, we're giving in to the wokeism. If you dare say anything that's wrong, let me, I'll make a real quick comment. If you look on your news, anytime you see an athlete, an actor, anybody famous who gets on live television and all of a sudden they start talking about Jesus Christ, you can look it up. It's on YouTube. It's, fun, it's, it's sad and funny at the same time. As soon as they start talking, you see the commentary get real uneasy. Like They start looking because they can't shut him up. They can't shut him or her up quick enough. And all of a sudden, they have technical problems every time. Every time. Oh, we lost them. As soon as they start talking about Jesus Christ, oh, we got technical problems on live television because they, they, they have to shut them off. And they say, oh, you know, what happened? Okay, that's people who hate God. Okay. So, the thing is, these people won't, won't answer for that. They'll say, well, we don't want to offend anybody. But if I was to get on the same television program and talk about Islam or Buddhism or any other religion on the planet or wokeism <coughs> or whatever, they would just applaud because they do it every day. And they would keep you on there. Like I heard one on The View saying that if they believe that if, if Christ came to earth right now, he would lead the, the pride parade. Well, considering how Christ is the creator, and he's the one who said it's, you know, I created a male and female, and for this reason a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, Matthew chapter 19. He wouldn't be leading the parade. He would love them enough to tell them the truth, and then they'd have to make up their own decision. That's what we're trying to do here. Okay, get back in here. He said he will make war with the saints, and he'll overcome them. And authority has given to every, given him of every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell upon the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. So those who worship him are, are the ones who are wanting to follow him. They're willing to, to let you know, listen to what he says and, and are willing to take the mark of the beast. It, who are not written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world. Okay, let me go to 11 through 18. Yeah, let's go ahead. 11 through 18, this is the beast that comes from the earth. Then us, uh, chapter 13, verse 11 through 18. Yeah, we'll finish this one up tonight. Then I saw another beast come out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. In other words, he has the authority. He sounds just like Satan. And he's going back and forth telling you what's going to happen and then shows you this is what's happening. And he speaks like the dragon, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. In other words, the one who gave, him the gave it to him in the first place. And causes the earth and all who dwell upon him to worship the first beast, that's Satan, whose deadly wound was healed. 
That's the Antichrist. 13, he performs great signs so that even he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the sight of men. In other words, he's going to do these false miracles and false signs, and he's going to have people falling down, worshiping him. 14, and he deceives those who dwell upon the earth by those signs which he has granted was granted to do them in the sight of, of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, and that that image of the beast should, should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image to be, of the beast to be killed. This is the beast, the image of the beast, which we now we have AI. This is, this is not hard. You can make an AI that can do this. Make an image where he can kill things. He's a ro it can be a robot that has the ability to kill people. It's a, it's a machine. It can be demon-possessed because there's no soul, or it can be t you know, it can, it's a computer. Verse 16, he says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark upon their right hand or on their foreheads. Because if you don't have a right hand, if you're an amputee, he can, he can still get you. And that no one may buy, uh, on their foreheads, that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for the number of it is the number of man, and his number is 666. Six is the number of man. 666 is the number of man trying to be God. That's Satan. <clears throat> so the, the thing is, it's going to tell you, you take, the, you take the mark and bow and worship his image. So you can't be in a coma or something, somebody stamp your hand real quick or whatever, whatever it's going to be. So, oh, gotcha. Hmm. You have it's bow and worship the image, which is consistent with what they did in Rome. Remember what happened in Rome when they used to, the they used to have little altars set up all over the kingdom with incense and a fire and a Roman soldier sitting there. Well, however many were there. And so you'd come up and you'd take some incense and they would mark your name down and they'd throw the incense in the fire and, and all they had to do, the only thing they had to do is take the incense to the fire and say, Caesar is Lord. Okay, citizen, have a nice day, Mr. Joe Smith. But if you refuse to do it, they would kill you, crucify you, put you in prison, whatever, for something so simple. Right now, we have people that are willing to sacrifice the name of Christ. Say, well, if we just don't use his name, or if we just kind of, you know, don't, don't be so fanatical about it, then you won't offend men, but you will offend God. He says, you're, you're, if you deny me in front of men, I'll deny you in front of the Father. Think about that. Is your stuff, is your stuff absolutely worth your salvation? It means you're, you're, you didn't have anything in the first place. In other words, you don't lose your salvation, but you're willing to compromise to keep your stuff. Okay, so that's coming. And right now, it's happening right now. You've got these companies that are willing not to say anything that's you know inappropriate to them. And it's not woke. You can say anything you want to about a perversion, but you can't say anything about Jesus Christ or they'll cut you off because that's truth, because they're offended and convicted by the truth of Christ, even though they may not believe in him, because it's, they don't know where they're going when they die. We do. Okay? So, yeah, they're offended by that because the one that they follow is offended. Real quickly, and I'm going to end it here. Uh, Give me five minutes. I've been, uh, this is to answer some more questions, obviously. Who are the 144,000? That's in, in chapter 7 and chapter 14. We're told by our Jehovah Witness friends, uh, who I have some friends that are, and we, we disagree, but the the thing is, they're saying, well, the 144,000 are the ones that are actually going to be in a, in a heaven above earth, and we'll be, we'll be stuck here on earth forever. Well, the problem is, they're saying that most of the 144,000 have already come and they already, you know, came in the first century and whatever. Nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in the in the Christian Bible, the original Bible, in the in the Dead Sea Scrolls or the New Testament, which the 60 something thousand copies of the manuscripts of the New Testament, does it say 144,000 except in Revelation chapter seven and chapter fourteen? It says in the it says there will be. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. 
These will be twelve. These will be one hundred and forty-four thousand evangelists. As God says He'll put His mark upon their forehead. Where do you think Satan got the idea to put it on your forehead or your hand? Wouldn't it, it's not an original idea. Satan only came up. The original, only original idea Satan came up with was sin and disobedience to God, to the one He saw that knew, He knew He created, got created by. Okay. These 144,000 men are going to be Jewish, not Gentile, Jewish, virgin men who have not, who have not known a woman. That's obviously it's a virgin. In other words, they've not had sex with a woman. They're Jewish, and they're going to be supernaturally uh, transformed and go all over the earth and be able to speak all the different languages necessary. And probably most of them, won't, well, probably, if not all of them, won't know who they are until, it's, until they're chosen. But there will be Jewish evangelist 144,000 sent all over the earth uh, like uh, uh, Jack Hibbs said he says like having 144,000 Pauls sent all over the earth and they, they, they will evangelize these are not these are not ones that came in the first century so therefore that's completely against scripture it takes you 30 seconds to read it and figure out that the New World Testament is not correct that's the Joe Witness Bible um yeah, if you if you're just now reading or seeing this, uh, I'm not watching one for being warm and fuzzy. Uh, my wife hates that term. Um, the I, I, I got lied to when I was being taught as a kid growing up in the church over in Wichita Falls, and I didn't realize it until I started reading the Bible for myself. Here's what I'm asking y'all to do. We're gonna stop here. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and do a synopsis real quick on this. Is the reason we're doing the reason we're doing the this series is because to prove there's a seven year tribulation out of the Old Testament, Daniel and, Zach, and Zechariah, Daniel chapter nine, Zechariah chapter uh, fourteen. Okay, this shows a seven year tribulation. We know that Christ tells us, John tells us, Paul tells us. We even go into Jude and, and see this. I think it's Jude chapter or verse 17, I think. Well, anyway, um, so if there's a seven-year tribulation and Daniel and Zechariah say, well, there gives us the <coughs> absolute hour, the hour, the day, the location, and the season of the second coming of Christ, that means you're gonna, if you're in the tribulation, you're going to know exactly when he shows up. You're going to be able to get a lawn chair. Well, I know I'm speaking figuratively. You're going to be able to get a lawn chair Set it up, looking at the Mount of Olives, going, okay, that agreement was signed 700, uh, seven times 360 Jewish days. So that would mean tomorrow, you know, you figure it out in your calculator, is when he's going to show up. It's going to be in the evening. So we know the approximate hour, and it says it's going to be during the warm season. And it says it's going to be right there on the Mount of Olives, the same place he ascended from when the angels told the men of Galilee when he ascended in Acts. He says, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here? Because he's going to come back in the same way he left. And he says he's going to come back on the Mount of Olives. So you have that; those four facts. Matthew, Mark, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 say no one, says no one knows the hour of the day, not even the Son of Man. But you do know the season. And he says, if that's true, and this is true, he said, and also no one knows the hour of the day of the tribulation. If you're on this side, if you're on this side of the rapture, there's no way for you to know when the rapture is going to happen. So therefore, you have no idea when the tribulation is going to happen. If you're watching after the rapture and you see the signing of the peace agreement, you're going to know exactly when it's going to happen and when he's going to show up. And you know how many days you have to go to to survive. Why is this important to us as believers? Why, why are we studying this to know the validity of Scripture of how accurate it is and that you can trust it. People say, well, I just don't believe that. Well, I'm sorry. Is this a salvation issue? No. But if you got this wrong, what else do you have wrong? Read the Bible. Go tell people about the gospel. And if you're worshiping a Jesus that isn't God Almighty, then you're worshiping a different Jesus. You're not worshiping the Jesus who's the creator and the savior. And he says, there'll be many people who will come and say that I am Jesus, I am the savior, and are not him. So right now we have a bunch of churches, especially here in our own country, that are claiming that Jesus is just a good man. That's not the Jesus of the Bible, and you don't have salvation if you're putting your trust in that false Messiah. Okay, we'll be back here next week. Uh, we'll be going into...
uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah. We'll start off in the Old Testament proving the seven-year tribulation and how we will know exactly, which I've been reiterating this over and over again, on how we will, the people in the tribulation will know the exact hour, day, location, and season. Okay, if you have any questions, you can go to pray5.org, go to contact us and send it. Or here, if you're watching on YouTube, you can go ahead and make a comment. I do get them, uh, and I will try to answer them here, or I will, if, if I can do it short enough, I will answer it on YouTube. If you disagree with me, and just because you disagree with me, please don't bother sending me <coughs> a comment. If you're going to disagree with me, and respectfully, and show me where, like you can see on there, one man vehemently disagrees with me, that's okay. That's perfectly okay. Don't mind. Please send in your comments. Till next week, this is Scott with Pray5.org. Let's go ahead and pray out. Father, thank you for this time together. We ask that you would show us your way, give us your truth, and to make your salvation clear in our hearts. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Amen. See you next week.